knocks against the stars. My feet are on the hilltops. My fingertips are the valleys and shores of universal life. Down in the sounding foam of primal things, I reach my hands and play with pebbles of destiny. I have been to hell and back many times. I dabble in the blood and guts of the terrible. I know the passionate seizure of beauty and the marvelous rebellion of man and all signs reading keep off. My name is Truth, and I am the most elusive captain <laughs> in the universe. <laughs> I'm just kidding around. We finally got electroporation working. Let's dive into how we did it. weeks ago when I was finishing up the last LA River bioprospecting video, I mentioned in that video there were a couple of molds that I just wasn't able to run the PCR reaction on. And so what I do in that case is I lean on this mini prep kit that I have here. And this kit's really designed to purify out plasmids from bacteria, but it turns out that you can actually use this just to purify some DNA out of, say, spores that won't PCR and then solve the issues that cause the PCR reaction to fail. And so the first step of that is scraping some of those spores into a tube and putting a certain amount of solution one into this particular tube. If you look at the tube, you can actually see that it has a quite a bit of these spores in there. But it turns out that these spores or canidia are highly hygroscopic. That is, they reject water pretty intensely. And so if I were to put water in here right now and shake this up quite a bit, you would notice that the water really just won't mix in there. And so step one of the protocol is to actually put a certain amount of solution one into the tube. Well, I went to do that. And what happened, as soon as I pushed the liquid down in there, the spores rejected it and they flew everywhere. They flew all over to my kit. And with the lid being open, a bunch flew inside of here. And that basically means this kit is ruined because this is solution one. This is the first solution that goes in the kit. And so everything downstream potentially could be contained contaminated by canidia from these spores. Simultaneously, I had a long weekend trip planned ahead with some friends and I really didn't want to leave before I tried electroporation one more time. So I went through the process of creating an overnight culture, plated some antibiotics, plates for selection, electroporated, uh, about three to four samples, my memory serves me correctly, put them in the incubator and I left for the weekend, had a great time. But in the back of my mind, I was thinking about those plates and how they would look when I got back. Well, I'm back from a long weekend in the woods. And of course, one of the first things I had to do was come back home and check on the electrification attempts I made before I left. And I'm pleased to see that all of the plates show some successful transformants. Now you'll notice the colonies are a little bit big because they've been sitting in my incubator for about four or five days and now they're all a little bit desiccated as well. And uh, so yeah, they all show successful transformations. Although if you're looking here, you'll notice that the transformation rates are really, really low. Um, that said, I have some consistency here. They all show transformations, which is great. And I actually have several things that I've learned and several ideas on why I think these transformation rates are a little bit low. And so we'll talk about that now and get into what I'm gonna be doing to address this low transformation rate. But uh, one of the things that I've learned about the Spanish plasmid is that it is considered a low copy plasmid. That means it contains an origin of replication, which is just a, uh, if we look at a plasma map here, I don't even know if this has an origin. Here we go. Here's the origin of replication. This is a small piece of DNA that's in the plasmid, which tells the bacteria how to replicate. And you can use different origin of replications here, and some of them will cause the bacteria to create lots and lots of copies of the plasmid, and others of them are more regulated like the Spanish plasma, which I've discovered, and uh, are considered low copy. So that means that the bacteria that contains the Spanish plasma are not creating lots and lots of copies of it. 
So what's the significance of the plasmid being low copy and what does that have to do with the mini prep kit that I contaminated earlier? Well after getting these results I decided to look for a new mini prep kit that would support low copy plasmids. And typically these kits are the same as the regular mini prep kits like the one that I have, but they have adjusted protocols that call for a higher volume of bacteria and a higher volume of reagents. Which makes sense because if the bacteria isn't producing a lot of copies of your plasmid, well you need a lot more bacteria to make up for the lack of plasmid replication. So I headed to my local biosupply dealer's website and lo and behold, I found a mini prep kit targeting low copy plasmids and I decided to take a look at the protocol. Primarily, I just wanted to make sure that it's a kit that I can actually use in my lab. But something really interesting popped out at me when I did this. At the end of the protocol was a troubleshooting section and that section mentioned making sure that the spin column and the resulting elution was completely devoid of ethanol from the wash steps. And in particular, it listed the problem of plasma DNA floating out of the wells while running an agarose gel. And I got kind of excited because a few videos back, I tried to run a gel on the mini preps that I had been using for my electroporation experiments, and this exact thing happened to me. All of my samples wouldn't stay in the wells of the gel, and they just kept dissolving almost immediately upon pipetting them into the gel. And at the time, I didn't know why this was, and I just chalked it up to my poor loading technique, or maybe that it was I needed to use a lot more loading dye. But after reading this, I realized that the source of my electroporation challenges all along may very well be how I was preparing the DNA in the first place. I mean, if there's ethanol left over from the plasma purification step, it could be killing my cells, and furthermore, it would have an amplifying negative effect on downstream experiments like putting the plasma in agrobacteria. I mean, how bad would it be if I prematurely accepted my electroporation rates and then spent all my time and money on putting the plasma in agrobacteria to find that it just didn't work? Well, since I needed a new kit anyways, I decided to take the plunge, buy the kit, pick it up, and then rerun the plasma purification steps and see if that fixes our electroporation transformation issues. So here's a little preview of what this kit looks like. Some instruction manuals, some RNAs that I'll have to mix in here in just a moment. And then all of the different reagents and spin columns for extracting that DNA plasma. All right, while I work on running the new low copy mini prep kit on the Spanish plasmid, I think it might be helpful just to get a high level view of how these spin column based plasmid purification kits work. First of all, when you get the kit, it doesn't come with ethanol. You need to add your own and preferably something lab grade with a concentration between 96 and 100%. However, I use 95% and it worked just fine. You just need to take extra care to evaporate and spin off the ethanol during the wash steps. Speaking of the wash steps, let's look at the spin columns a little more closely. You can see that it's just a piece of plastic with a little white filter looking thing in the middle and an exit for liquid on the bottom and another large tube that it fits in to collect what filters through the column. This column is special in that it's made of a silica which happens to bind to and attract the negatively charged DNA particles. So when you run a kit, the first thing you do is create a big pellet of bacteria containing your plasmid. You mix in some lysing buffers to help break up the cells and release the DNA. You then run the lysed solution through the column where the DNA along with remaining lipids and proteins from the bacteria attach to the silica in the column. Since we just want the purified plasma DNA, we run ethanol through the column to dissolve out anything non-DNA while the plasma DNA sticks to the silica. If you follow the protocol to a T, it tells you just to spin down the column a couple of times for a minute or so to ensure that all the ethanol has washed through. But this is where my lack of experience created some problems because as it turns out, that isn't enough. To counter the ethanol remaining in the column, I not only had to spin the column down for additional 5 to 10 minutes, but I also had to put it in my heated incubator for 20 minutes to help evaporate off any remaining ethanol. I was able to confirm the ethanol was removed first and foremost by smelling the column. Once I couldn't detect the slightest smell of ethanol, is ready for the final elution step, which uses a low salt buffer like Tris EDTA to elute or wash the plasma DNA from the silica column into my tube for downstream use. So there we have it folks, after following through the protocol for this special mini prep kit that targets low copy plasmids, we have 80 microliters here of hopefully concentrated Spanish plasmid. 
So now I can work on setting up a gel and seeing if we can get a good estimation of the concentration so that we can continue on our transformation experiments. Okay, now that we've spent quite a bit of time this week on getting the Spanish plasmid all prepped out with a new mini prep kit at a higher concentration that we confirmed on the gel and without any ethanol, we are now ready to take some of this new overnight culture of DH5-alpha and see if we can't get some good transformation rates with electroporation. So let me get set up and we'll go ahead and get started. Before I review the final electroporation protocol that I've been working up to, I'd just like to say a few things about this journey. As a reminder, I have no degree or training whatsoever in biology, let alone genetic engineering and tools like electroporation. I started this journey a little over a year and a half ago with a couple of papers and buying this decades old equipment on eBay. And little by little, piece by piece, I broke down the goal of learning this tool into its constituent components and through a series of trials and errors, I ended up learning so much more than what I had originally intended. There's so many lessons here from how to self-learn new skills and embracing a process of iteration, but the one that I wanna call out the most is simply to just not give up. Failure isn't really failure, it's learning. And with each attempt, I formed a new hypothesis about what might've gone wrong. I tested it and just worked through the problem. Was it hard? Yeah, but I did it, and I'm incredibly thankful that I had this opportunity to share it with you. Now, let's review my own DIY electroporation protocol that you yourself can use in your own genetic engineering experiments. Inoculate some LB broth from a colony of E. coli using the strain of your choice. I like to use 12 milliliters in a falcon tube. Keep it on a warming pad or incubator and gently turn it over every 4 hours while leaving the lid loose for air exchange. I typically seed my cultures at around 7pm the night before and begin my experiments the following morning at 10-11am. to 11 AM. Next spin down 1.5ml aliquots of overnight culture for a few minutes or long enough to form a pellet using one tube per electroporation attempt. You can optionally double the cell volume by combining sequential spin downs of 1ml liquid culture. Next, place some sterile distilled water in a small glass of ice water. Dump out any remaining broth in the tubes containing the pellets and blot the tubes on paper towel to remove excess broth. Place one milliliter of cold water into the tubes and gently resuspend the pellets so that there are no visible clumps. Spin down the tube until the pellet reforms. Dump out the water, blot on a paper towel, and then repeat this washing step with one milliliter two more times for a total of three water washes. After washing, resuspend the pellet in 40 to 60 microliters of cold, sterile 10% glycerol solution and place the tubes on ice. Add one microliter of plasma DNA to the center of the suspension, allowing the surface tension of the water to draw the DNA from the pipette tip into solution. Gently flick the tube to mix. Using a cool cuvette, add the 40 to 60 microliters of DNA cell suspension to the bottom of a 2 millimeter cuvette and tap to distribute the suspension evenly. Draw up 1.2 milliliters of fresh LB broth into a pipetter in preparation for quick recovery of the cells. Place the cuvette into the electroporator and configure the device to use 2.5 kilovolts, 25 microfarads, and 200 ohms resistance. Electroporate. Quickly pipette the recovery broth into the cuvette and gently resuspend the electroporated cells. Transfer the cells with recovery broth back into a tube and place in an incubator for one to two hours to recover. Be sure to gently turn over the tubes every half hour or so and pop the lid open for air exchange. Place 150 microliters of the recovered electroporated cell suspension on warm plates containing the selection antibiotic. Finally, incubate the plates on a warming pad upside down overnight and confirm transformed colonies the following morning. And if all goes well, you should awake to find a plate full of transformed colonies like this one. 